Today, I'll be interviewing parent, educator, and writer, Kim Jocelyn Dixon. Kim has nearly 30 years of experience in the elementary school classroom and has taught in public and private schools and currently teaches literature and writing. She is the author of the book, The Invisible Toolbox, The Power of Reading to Your Child from Birth to Adolescence. Today, we'll be talking about the power of stories during difficult times. Welcome, Kim, Kim, and thanks for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to see you again. So as an advocate of shared reading, would you explain how a parent sharing good books with their child offers comfort? That's a great question. I think one of the first things that comes to mind that is powerful about a parent sharing books with a child is the connection that occurs between the parent and the child. It's a powerful bonding experience. When a parent sits down with a good book and their child sits together on the sofa or maybe cuddles together, um, they're telling them that the child is really important. The child is hearing and feeling that this time together means that they're important to the parent. So I think the connection is one of the most powerful things that comes out of the parent-child read aloud. Um, there's so many things that come out of this and that's really the reason that I wrote this book. But another thing that occurs to me is that since, since our topic today is about um, the advantage of reading to your child, especially during a difficult time, is it does provide a little oasis for them. I'm really um, very big on creating a family reading read aloud time daily. If that can be developed into a habit, that can be a super beneficial thing that affords the child and the parent a special time every day to look forward to. It's that time of closeness. And it's also um, a time that just offers a little escape from whatever might be difficult. For instance, the quarantine that we're experiencing right now and the absence of normal life, um, having that little time to escape into a story and to be together and to share that is a really powerful thing. It also fosters the imagination of the child and literally takes them out of their reality for a while in a super healthy way. It's so interesting what neuroscientists are discovering now about the impact of reading on the brain. You know, we used to think that reading only impacted the frontal lobe of the brain where the language processing center is, but recent studies have shown that when we read, every single part of the brain is engaged, which means that we experience the story as if it is actually happening to us. So we experience it on a sensory level, we experience it on an experiential level. So it literally does take, take us out of ourselves and out of our own reality. And then the other advantage that it provides, or one of them, because I could go on and on, but another one, I think that's so important during this difficult time is that um, we're starting to understand that the practice of reading is very similar. The physiological effect of reading on the body is very similar to what happens during meditation, that there's a very calming and soothing um, thing that happens with us mentally and physically when we sink into a good story. And so to share that with your parent during a time that's difficult to do that daily and know that that's something that you can both count on and look forward to can be a really powerful and comforting thing. Yeah, you, you mentioned some excellent points. I love the, the bond that you foster between the child and parent by having that reading time. Um, and something else that, that you uh, mentioned too, uh, and this was in the book is you don't want to wait until after your child starts school to say, okay, that's the time you're to start reading with them, but read from birth, even before birth. Uh, what have you noticed with your own child uh, in, in doing this and the benefits of doing that? Well, he's all grown up now and he's a reader. He's a, he's a lifelong reader. Yeah. I started reading to my son in utero towards the end of my pregnancy. I had received, I think three copies of good night moon at various um, baby showers. And so um, I hadn't really done 
any research on this topic. I've been a teacher for many years. And so I sort of instinctively knew that reading to your child is a good thing. I was always a reader. So I just started reading Goodnight Moon to him. Um, just, you know, maybe a month or so before his birth and then continued doing it when he was a baby. Um, read nursery rhymes was a really big part of what we did. And it just was part of our daily pattern. I remember that it was like after nap time was a great time because he was still kind of sleepy and not too active. And then after bath time at night, because he was winding down, I found that during his infancy and toddlerhood, those were really great times during the day. So reading was really part of our family experience. And he kind of grew up into that. And it was just something that we continued doing into his middle, upper, upper elementary school years, I guess. My book um, is subtitled The Power of Reading to Your Child from Birth to Adolescence. And I kind of wished that I'd continued it even longer than I did. But by the time he was, I don't know, maybe upper elementary, he was into Star Wars and was reading all the Star Wars novels over and over again. And he was just kind of into his own thing. But the fun thing is, um, and, and I just need to say that I, I do believe it had a huge impact on him academically. And that's another subject. We could get into that if you want to, but I'll just talk about it from a, a life skill, reading for pleasure perspective. Um, when we get together now, one of the things we always share is what are you reading? What are you reading? We trade books back and forth. We're both big um, nonfiction fans. And so we've been trading Eric Larson's books back and forth um, the last few months. I don't know if you read The Splendid and the Vile, but if you love history, those are great books to get into. So anyway, it has continued to be a point of connection for us, is my point, for a lifetime. And I'm, I expect that it will continue to be. Yeah, and, and one of the things that um, if, if your child is dyslexic, like I was dyslexic, is that that early reading from birth is such a big factor in how uh, well they, they'll do when they start school because that helps to, to build that pre-literacy foundation uh, because you're basically modeling reading for them even before they could even talk when you have them sitting in your lap mm -hmm. and you're uh, reading across the page with an open book and you go from left to right and top to bottom. You show them every time how reading works and, and they, that sticks with them. And so once they, they start school, they already have some of those basic foundations down. Wonderful point. That, that is so true. And that gets into the whole academic part of this, which I really get into in my book, because as a teacher of so many years, um, I, I've seen that again and again. What you're talking about is those early preschool years, um, when a parent reads to a child, they are literally building an internal infrastructure for them that lays the foundation of all the pre-literacy skills that they need, the things that you just mentioned about how reading works. It communicates to them that there is a payoff in reading, that this strange thing that we do with putting symbols and meaning and sounds together has a payoff. There's something to it because you, those children come to school already understanding that there's a whole world behind reading that's a, it's a really exciting and important one that they've already been part of. So you're absolutely right. There is a huge value in doing this. And it's one of the reasons that I'm so passionate about talking about the subject because, um, because parents need to understand how important it is. Yeah, and especially now um, with all the extra stress that uh, children and parents both are dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, stories, as you mentioned, are a great way to kind of get away, to, to have an escape. Uh, so what experiences have you had recently in which reading has played a helpful role in that regard? As a matter of fact, I just finished writing about an experience that I had um, as a teacher. I am teaching fifth grade now in remote learning have been really since last spring and I teach literature and writing. And so a couple of weeks ago, 
when we zoomed in every morning as we do and had our morning meeting, I had a check-in with my students and um, I was aware that there were fires happening in the periphery. It wasn't happening right in my community, but it was happening near enough that I had good friends I was concerned about. And I learned that some of my students were also being impacted by fires. In fact, um, one of my students had had to evacuate that very morning and she was zooming into class with us um, from a hotel. And many of the students were very anxious about it for themselves and their families and for their friends and each other. And you could sense, you could feel the anxiety in the class. And it's amazing how even in Zoom, um, there, there's a lot you can tell about what's going on with your students. I mean, you're apart, but you can still feel it. You really can. So, um, so it was a, you know, here we are in distance learning for one thing, we're not together. Um, we're in the middle of this election season with parents being upset and um, concerned with all that's going on politically. Um, the virus has impacted our lives. And now on top of this, we've got the fires. I'm in Southern California and people are really worried for their lives and their, and their homes. And so into where we've got all this going on in my class. And, and that day, what we had, what I had planned to do is to continue reading a novel that we've been reading with them. We were reading the great brain, which is an excellent classic that I strongly recommend by John D Fitzgerald. And it happened to be the chapter where the, um, title, the namesake of the book, Tom, who is the great brain, had been unjustly paddled by the new teacher who was very harsh in his methods, it would paddle all the time. And he had decided that they were going to frame this teacher by um, planting evidence that he was a secret drinker. So it was kind of a shocking chapter and exciting and it takes place in 1890s Utah. So it could not have been further from the reality of what the students were experiencing in their lives at that moment. And I have never been so happy as I was that morning that I am a literature teacher and that we had the opportunity after sharing our feelings about what was going on in our vicinity to do a deep dive into this chapter because it really took us out of ourselves for a while. Because as I was talking about, when we read, we experience the story as if it's actually happening to us. So it was just a lovely, comforting escape to be able to fully immerse ourselves in this crazy chapter that was so satisfying and um, kind of just take a break from what was going on. And I think that's one of the most powerful things that reading can do for us. Yes. Um, I want to talk briefly about your book, The Invisible Toolbox. Now we had uh, talked uh, a little bit uh, about um, some aspects of your book during the interview. I'm going to go ahead and hold it up, The Invisible Toolbox. Um, it's that name, The Invisible Toolbox, may sound a little strange to some parents. Uh, could you explain a little bit why you called it The Invisible Toolbox? Sure. I, I had a little bit of an epiphany, I think, many years ago. I, I, I used to be a third grade teacher. And you know, third grade is that watershed year where if students are not reading on grade level, statistically, 75% of those who don't never will, which is a really concerning statistic. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I was teaching at a public school then, and it's an excellent public school, my neighborhood school, the school my son went to, um, it was wonderful. But there were always a few students who were who were behind and it seemed that um, sometimes that the interventions that were offered didn't necessarily pull them out. I mean, I, I and again, that's a different topic. I, because I'm a firm believer in that 25% and there are definitely things that we can do. But anyway, what I, what I realized at that time, I think was that what the students who were not able to read at grade level. And again, this takes off the table any students who are dyslexic with, and with an actual genuine processing of um, concern. 
but stu there were students who simply did not have that internal infrastructure that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And that's where the invisible toolbox comes in. It just struck me one day in a parent teacher conference that, that every child comes to kindergarten with an invisible toolbox. And if their parent has read to them regularly before kindergarten, that invisible toolbox is filled to overflowing with all those pre-literacy skills that we were talking about a few minutes ago. The understanding of the way books work, they've been exposed to language and vocabulary that they won't hear anywhere besides in books. Um, all those things that help them to be successful, all that scaffolding is in place if they've been read to. And, and my heart has broken for the kids that have not had that because they're in, they're, they come to school with these invisible toolboxes that are empty and school is a struggle for them because the infrastructure that they need to learn and take advantage of what school offers isn't there. And so what they're needing to do is catch up and have that infrastructure built. And I think it is possible to do that. I think it's a lot harder later, but it's doable. So that's where the invisible toolbox comes from. Yeah, the, the invisible toolbox, I highly recommend it. A wonderful book, it's an easy read. And I'm speaking from a dyslexics uh, point of view. It's also available on audio from audible.com. Um, and uh, you can listen to it uh, actually in one sitting. So uh, Kim, thank you very much for talking with us today. It's been uh, you a pleasure, can, thank you. So you can click on the link in the description below to learn more about Kim Jocelyn Dixon and her book, The Invisible Toolbox.